Joining me today is Justin Van Heerden from New South Wales, Australia, fighting out of Windang. He's the Coastal Combat Featherweight Champion. Sports a record of nine wins and five losses, and he's fighting Muhammad Alavi at a turn of 57 on July 16. Mate, we're about a week out from the fight. How are you feeling, brother? Yeah, feeling pretty good, man. Like, uh, just did, like, this morning, did my, like, third last sort of hard session for the camp. We've got two more to go. Um, and then that's pretty much a wrap. Like, got my last sparring session on Saturday. Um, but I've seen even then, you know, we're a week out from the fight at that point. So it's not going to be like overly crazy. Just sort yeah. of getting those last couple, like sort of probably will only probably do like maybe three, four rounds. Just kind of, you know, get that last little shake out. Just, yeah, move around with a few different people and just kind of put a stamp on the end of the camp. Good stuff, mate. The weight's coming off all good. Yeah, that's all an easy process. Obviously, I do do all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, my nutrition and stuff's all done by the boys from the flight dietitian. Like, you know, yep. uh, I work with Jack. You know, he's based in in Melbourne, so you know, it's pretty much like clockwork now. Obviously, this is my fourth fourth sort of camp doing it with them. Um, so yeah, things are things are all trekking well, and it's sort of the nutritional side of things alongside my strength and conditioning sort of stuff that I do with the boys at Bay Med. It's kind of just running like clockwork now, so. The body's the body's good, it's firing well. The weight's where it needs to be. It's just yeah, just pretty much it. It's, it's an easy process. Beautiful. How how does that compare to when you when you were doing nutrition? Were you doing it by yourself previously? Yeah, before that, I was just kind of doing it myself and just yeah, honestly, um, you know, some of the stuff that I was doing beforehand, I was kind of like you know, there was some things that were being that was still like I was doing correctly. Uh, but for the most part, you're really just winging it, man. Like at the end of the day, you're just kind of going off what you've sort of figured out for yourself, what other people have sort of shared towards you. But, you know, compared to what I'm doing now, I'd say I was sort of maybe doing that that process at like maybe 45 to 50%, uh, you know, whereas now it's like 90 to 100%. We're just optimal. We're just, you know, ticking all the boxes. So it's, it's very eye-opening, obviously, and that's going to be the case. I mean, at the end of the day, my job's to go out there and perform and fight. My job's not to know how to successfully, you know, handle my nutrition and all that sort of stuff. Like obviously now I'm a bit more educated in that sense because I'm learning it from a professional and I'm ticking all these boxes. But, you know, at the end of the day, that's for them to work out. They do all the stuff behind it and I just listen, follow what I need to follow and just carry on. Just do your job. Exactly. Um, all right, I, we will get into the fight in a little bit, but I want to go back to sort of the beginnings of your, your martial arts career. You had your first amateur fight in 2014. Before that, you, you grew up wrestling in, in South, uh, South Africa, yes? That's correct. How, describe that sort of journey and, and how you fell into MMA for us. Um, yeah, so I started wrestling when I was a, a kid. Started re- The first two sort of sport I started doing was wrestling and gymnastics. Um, you know, did those pretty much all the way through uh when i came to australia i was about 14 15 14 probably when i moved here um obviously wrestling is not really as big a sport here as it is in south africa or america a place like that uh so then pretty much competed in every other sport you could think of you know basketball hockey cricket rugby league rugby union afl athletics uh yeah if it was a sport i was pretty much doing it um and then you know yeah around 2000 end of 2013 started 2014 you know by then i was sort of really getting into sort of watching mma you know following along with the sport and then i was like kind of interested so i googled you know if there was a gyms around me or anything like that at the time i was based up in north queensland and i was like all right maybe i could find a jiu-jitsu gym and kind of you know get stuck in give it a go see if i like it see if i want to you know train and get stuck in um pretty much went there, started training. I was training for like six months. And then uh, my coach at the time, he was overseas in Fiji, gave me a call and he's like, hey, someone's pulled out of an event um, next weekend. So it was like on a week's notice, do you want to jump in and and have your first fight? I was like, yep, let's make it happen. So uh, yeah, pretty much flew down to Brisbane, had my first fight. Um, You know, it was a crazy experience, obviously, you know, just kind of jumping in for the first time, being, you know, being in there sort of dealing with all that and then after that I was hooked after I got that first fight out of the way um, I won by triangle in the third round after 
a back and forth sort of two rounds was kind of, yeah, I got to experience the whole sort of process of just being like thrown in the deep end. And then after that, I was pretty much hooked and I was like, all right, I think I found the sport that I'm going to sort of pursue for the rest of my life. And now I sort of compare that to where I am now. Um, you know, I had a fair few amateur fights, was kind of just was in my mind. I was like, all right, this part's just sort of, let's just get the experience in. Let's try and experience everything we can so that, you know, when I eventually start pursuing this professionally, nothing's going to surprise me. And I think that's sort of worked to a T. And like now I'm, you know, nine, nine, like my record's nine and five at the moment. You know, I'm about to have another massive fight on July 16th, but you know, it's all, it's all coming together quite nicely. Like I featherweight, you know, my record's eight and three, my last five and four and one with three finishes. So Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm um, firing right where I need to be and just going to continue that momentum moving forward. So, you know, I have another big test in front of me, a, a, a good fight, but, um, you know, I just feel like I'm right where I need to be and that just happens to be levels ahead. And every fight, I feel like I'm, I'm doing that. And especially since I moved to freestyle, like I feel like the version of me now would fight the guy that had his first fight a year ago under the freestyle banner and he would just run through him completely. It wouldn't even be close. And that's what you want. And mm-hmm. I think that translates just as a whole from our gym. I mean, if you look at Volk's fights as well, He's gotten better between each fight, just so much better. And I look at my teammates and I look at everyone and that sort of just continues because it's just just do the work, look to improve and just obsess over that. What was the um, the goal back then when you were starting out in the AMs? Did you know that this is something you, you did want to do professionally pretty seriously? Yeah, 100%. I think I was always going to be end up doing some sort of combat sport, whether that was you know going to be MMA, boxing or whatever there was always going to be something i think i was going to always sort of subconsciously drawn to that and looking for more like i obviously enjoy competing in sport and and in and all the sports i did growing up and you know even like team sports all that sort of stuff but i think i was always just looking for that thing that sort of next thing that that thing that puts all the emphasis on me you know because at the end of the day like obviously when you're in there it's all on you the lot you know the lights are on that eyes are focused on you everything's sort of just it's an individualized sort of pursuit for that 15 minutes um and i I think that's sort of what i was sort of lacking and missing from other sport and then you know once i started doing like training and then once i sort of had those first couple amateur fights i was like all right i i i want to do this and i want to pursue this and i want to you know i set that goal for myself pretty uh, pretty quickly i was like i want to do this professionally and i want to you know be a world champion um and then that got reinforced, you know, after I fought Rodolfo Marquez, you know, won my first Australian title. I was like, that that was ticked off the list. And I remember just like right then and there in the cage, we were taking photos after the fact and that sort of stuff. And I just remember thinking to myself, right, that's ticked off the list. That's gone. That's done. If I win more Australian titles or whatever, you know, so be it. But I don't really care at the end of the day. But now the focus is the world title. And then there was sort of when I – Moved to freestyle when I moved down to New South Wales, came to freestyle um, and, you know, sort of being part of a few of Volk's camps and seeing the sort of day-to-day approach that he has, it reinforced it for me again. And it was like, all right, I know what I need to do and I just need to stay on the path and continue to do those things and then I will get there and I'll, and I'll tick off that goal as well. So, yeah, I, I feel like I knew, I knew early on I was going to pursue this, like I said, for the rest of my life and compete. Um as much as I can and mm-hmm. sort of, yeah, now I know that even more. It's It's been reinforced even more. You, you like to keep busy by the looks of it. I think you had three fights a year up until about 2021 and then everything sort of just shut off. Um, was that all COVID related? Yeah, pretty much. Like COVID kind of put the brakes on things um, a little bit. Like obviously 2020, I fought Rodolfo Marquez at the start of the year, like February and then right around then obviously – this whole COVID thing happened. No one knew what the heck was going on. You know, we're in lockdowns and stuff like that. So everything kind of took a, took a step back. Um, then later on that year, uh, I was at a show supporting a teammate of mine um, who was scheduled to fight. We're at the weigh-ins. Um, and then there was a pro lightweight fight that was on the card between Tim Schultz and Cody Barnwell. And then at the weigh-ins, Tim Schultz showed up to the weigh-ins and he was just completely out of it. He fainted twice was just out of it. Um, and so the promoter was like, well, I can't let him fight. I just happened to be there. 
I knew that because of the COVID stuff, no one knew what was going on. You didn't know if you were going to get, to get another chance to fight again anytime soon. Um, Cody had already been up in Queensland for like a month and a half because obviously with travel restrictions and stuff like that, he came up early and just wanted to make sure that nothing got in the way of fighting. And then I sort of looked at it and went, you know what, fuck it. Like, I want to fight. Uh, I don't want to miss out. I don't want to like not be able to fight. So they did like, they ended up being like an outdoor event. I jumped in, like took the fight at the Wayans, fought Cody. Unfortunately, the fight didn't go my way. It was a, just a, it was a weird one. Like, you know, you can't mm-hmm. really cry over, over spilt milk. It was a weird stoppage. Like, um, and, uh, you know, but I like still got in, got to compete. And I was like pretty, pretty happy about that. And then, yeah, 2021 was a bit weird again. You know, it was just kind of, uh, 2021 was sort of the, the COVID kind of stuff started taking a break, a break a little bit. Like, I mean, it affected like some things. Like I was obviously scheduled to fight Jack Jenkins. He couldn't travel because of the COVID restrictions. I ended up fighting Rod Costa instead. Um, and that was obviously my, my last loss. Uh, Sorry, before you keep going, was that meant to be a title fight with the with Jack Jenkins? Yes. Yeah. yeah so okay, Jack. Yeah. So what happened was originally, so I'd fought, um, I just fought Michael Barber, and then it, it, that show in Perth was obviously like three and a half weeks or some or three weeks later or four weeks later. Uh, Jack was scheduled to fight Alavi. Alavi broke his hand, so they offered it to us. At the time, Joe and Alex were still overseas because they'd obviously got COVID and were stuck overseas. And then they started filming the Ultimate Fighter and the Ortega fight got rescheduled. So there's all that craziness. So I didn't even have my coaches with me. Um, we decided to take the fight with Jack because, you know, at the time with coming out of the barber fight, there was no injuries, no issues or anything like that. And like, you know, it kind of made sense for me to sort of take that fight after talking to Joe and Alex. We were like, all right, let's, let's do this. Um, that fight fell through, took the last minute sort of replacement with Rod because at that point I was just like, well, I just want to fight. Like I've, I've just built, I've just done like another three weeks of hard, hard training, hard work to prepare myself for a title fight, like a title fight on three weeks notice. And I was just firing and was like, all right, well, I still want to fight. Took the fight with Rod. I mean, in hindsight, I can sit here and go, oh, you know, I shouldn't have taken a short minute, the last minute replacement, blah, 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 all sort of stuff like that. But that's, you know, there's no point doing that. I chose mm-hmm. to compete, got in there with Rod. You know, first half of that fight, I felt like I was just ticking all the boxes, felt like I was doing everything, felt like I was controlling everything. Um, I felt like my wrestling pedigree uh, took the any, uh, any idea of engaging in a grappling exchange like from him, like trying to pursue taking the fight to the ground off the table unless I chose to initiate that and, you know, then sort of would go from there. Um, you know, and then in the second half of that fight, just, yeah, just got a bit lazy with my distance with, with you know, defensively kind of getting out of range enough when I was, after I was finishing my combinations and, you know, Rod capitalized on that. So it ended up being a better night for him. And, you know, it is what it is. There's like a few factors at playing that I can sit there and identify after the fact. You're always going to be able to watch something back and pick out little things. Mm-hmm. You know, at the end of the day, like I'll call it like it is. I just didn't take the dude seriously when it came to the stand up. Like not at all at, the, at that time. You know, I just thought, all right, he's a really, really good grappler. You know, he's got some pop in his punches, but I didn't, you know, I thought I just in my head, I was just like, well, I don't need to worry about that area. Where I need to be worried is if this dude decides to use his world class jujitsu and try and you know, control me on the mat, look to submit me, look to just wear me out or look to try and just do that. So, you know, but that's, it is what it is. You'd sort of pick out what you did good, pick out what you did bad, just work on it. Like I said, we constantly do that at freestyle and that's pretty much immediately what I did. Um, and then, you know, obviously then after that fight, just was focused on improving training, you know, looking for fights after that to sort of, you know, rebound get myself back to to where i need to be um kind of missed out a fair bit because yeah just couldn't get fights fights were falling through travel restrictions did back-to-back camps alongside my teammate colby thickness and we just kept missing out on being able to fight um and then obviously started this year in february got offered to fight on hex on yeah against josh riley so that Mm -hmm. kind of kicked off my year um and then i said to myself at the start of the year i want to have minimum three fights this year and three finishes that's my goal you know, two fights, two two wins, two finishes. I'm on track to do that. Um, but, you know, that's what I wanted minimum for the year. So, you know, July 16th, if I can go out there, do my job, do that again, you know, get another win, get another finish, especially against an undefeated guy who's, 
kind of the only person outside of Jack Jenkins that I haven't fought in featherweight division, um, then, you know, that sets me up quite nicely to finish the year in a big way, get one more in before the end of the year for the light, you know, for the featherweight title. And then after that, you know, we'll see what comes next, but you know, obviously I'm focused on, on that, but you know, it's all, I feel like the way it's all come together, the way that 2020 sort of went with COVID and then last year with, you know, the boys being stuck overseas, you know, I had those two fights, but I didn't sort of have Joe and Alex there. And I th- I feel like, you know, that's always going to make a difference when you actually have the people that are investing the time into you and helping guide you and helping you improve. If they're going to be in your corner when you're out there competing, especially in these fights, like it's high stakes for me, like the guys I'm fighting, the caliber of people I'm getting in there with. Um, and I feel like that's shown this year so far, like that's shown the, the difference that that's made. Also just, you know, having my coaches in my corner, you know, giving you, giving, being able to give you those adjustments to make as the fight plays out so that you can get out there and achieve the desired result. And I think that's what you saw in both fights. Um, obviously with the fight with Josh Riley, the first round was just kind of a shout out to me. The second round, he had some success, uh, was able to do some good work. So it kind of was one apiece going into the third. I knew I needed to win the third round. Uh, Joe and Alex told me what they wanted me to do. They reinforced well, the, sort of the pathway that we could take to get to the, the win. Went out there and did that. The fight with Alan, sort of similar. First round, shout out to me. Second round, he you know he found a little bit of success here and there. He started, um, you know, I, uh, sort of I started allowing him to you utilize the skills and the areas that, that he's very proficient in. Um, and then, you know, sort of had to make that, that adjustment mid round and mid fight and uh, capitalize to be able to go and get the win. And sort of, that's what I did again. So I feel like, you know, the work I'm doing, the improvements I'm making, um, you know, that all builds up and, and ties in together. But then at the end of the day, having Joe and Alex there with me when I'm actually competing, that's kind of, you know, the, the last piece of the puzzle because I know that I have two of the most experienced, you know, individuals in the sport in my corner that are going to be able to call things on the fly. Even, you know, because I like to think, you know, I'm pretty experienced at, at this point. I feel like I have a really good fight IQ, so I'm able to sort of make the reads and adjustments as well, you know, when I'm in there fighting. But, you know, it doesn't hurt when I have those two guys adding on to that and telling me what they want and what they expect and, and where we can sort of capitalize. Yeah, they're there backing you up. Um, we'll move on to to Muhammad Alavi himself now. He's seven and zero, six finishes. He's looked pretty sharp. How did this fight come together? Did you? It was a bit a, a bit tough for him to get an opponent, I believe. Um, yeah, I sort of. So after I fought Josh, uh, uh, you know, sort of like looking at what was sort of next. Um, I'd actually saw like XFC put up a post about Alavi saying like, "Oh, we need you know looking for someone to fight him. No one wants to step up." all this sort of stuff. And then I got actually got messaged by the promoter asking if I wanted to fight him on XFC in June. And, you know, to be honest, I just called it like it was. I just said to the promoter, I was like, no, not really. Like, why would I want to fight on your show when I can fight this dude on Eternal, which is the biggest promotion in the country, that has the most eyeballs on it, the most exposure. I can still fight the same guy and you know, at the end of the day, I'm going to get paid better too. So, you know, everything just made sense for me to do that. You know, there's no one that I'm worried about fighting. And like, so, you know, I knew it was always going to be me that was going to end up taking this matchup with Alavi, stepping up and, you know, getting in there with him Um, because no one else wanted to, if no one else wanted to do it, whatever, that's cool. My only, I wouldn't say thing that I wanted to tick off was be to fight on Eternal because why not UFC fight pass? You know, the, 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 the production value is insane. The way you're treated is brilliant. Cam and Ben do an amazing job, you know, and you're going to get compensated very well, especially me because I've fought for Eternal um, so many times. In, what, Eternal 6, I think, was your first, the first one you jumped on, wasn't it? Yeah, and I've like, you know, so I, I've, I've, I'm like going to, the opportunities come up for me to keep fighting for Eternal, I'm going to take them. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that's kind of how it came together. And I kind of uh, then, so then... They they'd obviously con- contacted Joe for the XFC one, and then but then Cam was trying to put it together on his show already as well because he was like, all right, this is a fight we can put together. Um, and then you know when when Joe kind of approached me and was like, all right, well we you know we can do it uh, in June on XFC or, or Cam or Cam's looking to put it together, 
in, in July, you know, I was like, let's go, let's do it on eternal list. And then it was like a couple of days after that, they were like, yep, we're locked in, we're sorted. And I was pretty much like, all right, cool. Stoked. So yeah. So then obviously, you know, I made it pretty clear after that, that like, I was like, you know, it's not like I have any disdain towards the guy. I don't, I don't know. Every time I've dealt with it with, with Muhammad um, and we got some mutual sort of people that we're connected by, you know, he's been nothing but cool, nothing but respectful. So I don't have to, there's no, there's no reason for me to even to, to sit there and try and trash the dude or have to be like, do any sort of shit like that. It's, it's just like I sort of said, when, when the fight came together, I was like, we're the two best people in the country. We're the two best featherweights, you know, we're right at the top of the top of the pile. Um, it's high stakes, high rewards. So why not, why not get in there and compete with someone like that? So yeah, it kind of was a no brainer to put this fight together. It's not really a question how you want to end fights generally uh, with the wrestling and the jujitsu background. You're pretty deadly on a sub, but your striking has definitely evolved in the last few years. Um, is standing and trading with things something that, that you'll be looking to do on July 16th? Um, yeah. I mean, in some capacity, I'm going to look to just do whatever I need to do in there. And if that ties into me, exchanging with him on the feet because obviously you can't just go in there and not expect that you're not going to exchange on the feet like i'm gonna we're gonna we're gonna get in there and you know that's the sort of thing but there's a difference between exchanging with someone on the feet and then doing it where they're able to utilize their skills and abilities and their strengths obviously Mm -hmm. standing in the pocket with this dude and just throwing leather that ties into exactly what he wants like that's what he likes to do he comes forward he's aggressive he tries to knock you out he throws everything full clip and you know the dude's explosive and, and, and hits quite hard and he's shown that in some of his other performances. So, I mean, like I don't need to get into a stand up fight in the pocket, just throwing leather, not being defensively sound just for my ego, just cause I want to show that I can do that. Like I've done that before. Like people can go back, go watch my fight with Aiden Maroki uh, on eternal that, that I had, you know, back in the day I took that fight. Same thing. I took that fight at the, at the Wayans cause uh, Tristan Murphy pulled out. Um, and then, you know, got in there and had a three round scrap with, with Aiden up two weight classes. So, you know, I don't need to, I don't need to get into a, like a, a scrap like that for my ego, just cause I want to show that, you know, I'm well-rounded and I can, I can do that, but you know, I'm certainly ready for anything. And, and I'm, I'm obviously, if the, the opportunity is there for me to showcase the improvements I've made, in, you know, across the board, especially with that side of things, I'll take advantage of that. But at the end of the day, you know, if people, if he, if if he and his team and people keep approaching me as just a guy that, like, just a wrestler and that's it, you're doing yourself a disservice. Like, if you think that I'm just a guy that can wrestle and grapple, cool. Like, you're gonna do yourself a disservice if you don't take me seriously and think that I'm a well-rounded mixed martial artist. I mean, especially with where I'm based now and the people I train with and the work that I'm doing. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm I like to think that I've improved across the board. Um, but at the end of the day too, you know, like the opposite end of that coin is, okay, if I'm just a wrestler and a grappler, so let's wrestle and let's grapple. Let's see if you can stop that because everyone else at this point hasn't been able to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, if at the end of the day, like I look at this fight and I've got to, I've got to play with what's in front of me. I've got to be defensively aware, defensively sound. I've got to try and dictate how this fight takes place, take his strengths off the table you know, pursue my line that's going to give me the best course of action to get the the win and to get a finish. But at the end of the day, like the wrestling and the grappling, that's you know that that's always sharp and that's in my back pocket. And at the end of the day, if it comes down to it, if I just got to grind this dude out for 15 minutes and put a pace on him and utilize my wrestling and my grappling, I'm more than capable of doing that. I could do that for 25 minutes. So, um, you know, it's that does give me confidence to know that I have that in my back pocket. You know, I have the ability to do that. Um, and, I, you know, I think I've shown that before, like my cardio, my ability to keep pushing and putting a pace on people like that's just going to be there. That's not going anywhere. Um, but I'm excited, man. I'm excited for the challenge. I'm excited to see what he brings out. You know, he, you know, w- what adjustments he makes. We could get in there and this dude could just straight up come in with a combination and shoot a blast double on me and then engage in the wrestling and try and, dictate that area who knows like that's what excites me i know the guy's game i know he's you know he's got bad intentions he looks to put people away he wants to finish the fight um so you know i've obviously got to be aware of that and be on point but i'm excited by that at the same time like i look for i'm looking forward to to showcasing what i said what i've been saying in the lead up and that 
this isn't a level test fight for me. People keep telling me, like, all I've heard from people is, okay, this guy's dangerous. He's t-. And that's, that, that's true. That's cool. But at the end of the day, his course of action, I guarantee you, is to come out there and knock me out. That is the only pursuit or goal that he has. This dude's not been doing any sort of grappling or wrestling uh, or anything where they're looking to do that. Like, this guy's just going to come out and he's going to try and knock me out. He's going to throw the full clip. And if he's able to do that, then it's, you know, credit to him. But when that goes out the window and you're unable to do that, what adjustments are you going to make? Because you can't take me down. And if you did can't, if you, if you did take me down, you can't hold me down. And if you could hold me down, you've got to worry about submissions and all that stuff from everywhere, which I've showcased. Like, you know, I showcased that in my last fight. Like, I'm dangerous everywhere. There's no point in a fight with me where you're safe. If you make a mistake, I'm going to capitalize on it. And then it's going to be, you know, that's all she wrote. But, um, yeah, obviously, I'm, I'm super respectful of his abilities, his skills, the dangers that he offers, because he is a very dangerous dude. But I feel like I've got more weapons, more paths to victory, and I've just got to, you know, go out there and perform the way I know I can and the way that I have been in my last couple of fights. And, you know, then everything's going to sort of come together. Assuming you get up at Eternal six, uh, 67, sorry, a win over a 7 and 0 prospects a pretty good badge to have in your mind what's next and and what do you do to get the UFC to take notice well uh, yeah a win over Alavi puts me in a really good spot cuz like i said outside of Alavi the only person that i would have not fought is Jack Jenkins but you know i'm pretty sure he's off to the races at this point which is which is mm. cool it's well deserved like the guy should be you know in my opinion um, but yeah we'll sort of see but this puts me in a really good spot i'll move to 10 and 5 three fight win streak hopefully three finishes um, I've just I've beaten like you said an undefeated prospect, and then if I, you look at my resume, then at featherweight like I've beaten I've beaten you know I've beaten Rodolfo, I've beaten him, I've beaten Philpot, you know I've just I've kind of you know cemented myself as being the number one featherweight in the country at this point, and then uh, if I look at that from there, before the year's out, if we can get a fight another fight in for the featherweight title, so be it, we'll do that, but um. Yeah, it's just got to depend on how things come together. Like, obviously, if, depending on what happens with Jack, if I, you know, I don't know if they if they're still waiting and they they want to have one more fight for the guy, or you know, it comes together that I fight him for the belt. Cool. If I end up fighting someone else, I don't really care. I know that Diego and Alan are scheduled are going to be scheduled to fight in August um, now instead. So, you know, who knows? Maybe I will end up fighting the winner of that fight. You know, I, I at the end of the day, I know where this puts me. It puts me in a really good spot. And, you know, even after this fight, like I'm pretty much in a really good spot and on the UFC radar on whoever's radar, because it's pretty clear after this point that I'm the number one featherweight in the country. Like that's, that's what's going to cement it, especially if I go out there and finish this dude. I love the confidence, mate. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, last thing from me before I let you go, I'd love to get your favorite piece of Australian slang. You've been over here for, for a while now. What do you got? What do you like the best? What's tickled your fancy? Um... Oh, man, there's a couple. Uh, but probably my favorite thing, like my favorite sort of Australian thing is trying to like use, – you utilize it daily is like when you say yeah, nah, or nah, yeah, but trying to explain it to someone who has no idea what the <laughs> hell it means. That is always the, my favorite conversation to have with people when trying to explain that. But I feel like that is something that's just so uniquely Australian. Like It's so you, paradoxical, isn't it, man? It's, and, and, it's, and, it's, and it's that. And then the other thing is probably like – if you see like if you see someone and you like you're with someone or if you just you see someone you're not really you know you're not you don't really vibe with them you're like you know that's your mate but like if it's someone you like then they're a good count or something like that like and the, yeah, i just yeah, love yeah. i love the contrast between that um because <laughs> like yeah p it's hard to explain that to people too but that's sort of yeah shit like that just just cracks me up <laughs>